My name is Charlie Henson, and tonight I am interviewing Mr. Herbert Short. Okay, Mr. Short, thanks for coming, and I want to first know what your full name is and then something about your parents. Herbert Lee Short. I was born and raised in Tennessee, moved to Kentucky, and uh, my mother's name is Mary Lou, or was. All, they're all passed away now, except I have one sister living yet. And my brother was in the Navy at the same time I was in the Army. However, he's passed on now, too. And I have a sister living in Georgia and myself, which is the last of the family. So. What's your mother's maiden name? Caldwell. Caldwell. And then what was your dad's full name? Uh, his full name was Shelby Lee Short. And where in Tennessee did they did they live? Oh, in uh, Lincoln County mostly. <coughs> and, and that's around where? Oh, uh, Fayetteville, Tennessee, and Pulaski, mm -hmm. Tennessee, in that area. And I guess the largest, which was a, a town close by, was uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which was the co college state uh, town for them. Mm -hmm. So where were you in your pecking order of kids? First, second? First. Mm -hmm. First, oldest son? Mm-hmm. Okay. What did your dad do? Well, he drove a city bus and streetcars and so forth for the L N railway system. Tell me about your high school years. We're going to get you through high school. Well, I'm afraid we won't go that far. Okay. Then tell me about when you quit school. <laughs> well, really in the eighth grade, I guess. And uh, I had to quit to help the family. I went to work and helped the family a little. And in 1940, I joined the service. Okay. What did you do when you were in the eighth grade? What did I do? Yeah, what did you do? Did you work to help the family? Oh, yeah. But did you work on the farm? Or did you oh, no. I, well, I lived with my grandparents until I was about 16. I worked on the farm there. Then. When I went to the city of I, where my parents were, I uh, drove a truck for a big fish market. And also, earlier though, I had sold newspapers on a street corner. In Murfreesboro? <laughs> no, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And I, in 1940, then I joined the service at Fort Knox, Kentucky. So then... And tell me about your decision about joining and... Uh why you chose to join and things like that? Well, there wasn't, uh, for somebody who didn't have any education, there was no, no jobs that were really that good. And at first I, did, I wanted to go to the Marines, but I wasn't quite tall enough at that time because they had a little, uh, I think there was five foot nine you had to be, and I was only about five, eight and a half. I couldn't quite make it. And then I went to get my brother and said, well, let's go try the Navy. And well, he decided he didn't want any part of the service, so I said, well, one choice, I'll go to the Army. So I went and joined the Army. A month to the day after I joined the Army, my brother and a friend of ours joined the Navy. <laughs> and uh, during all the time that he was alive, uh, it seemed like that every time, well, being in a month early, than he, earlier than they were, I made a rank a little um, a month early, and they followed me every month almost with the same rank right behind me. So anyway, I went on that way almost uh, constantly. But uh, tell me about your basic training at Fort Knox. What was it? What was it like? And what was it like for you? And what you did? Well, what they call they call it recruit training then. They didn't call it basic training. And we took four months of training. And you went straight to a unit. You didn't. Uh, you took your training at the unit, not with a uh, bunch of recruits somewhere else. And so, as such, but uh, I think in the bunch that I that went in with me, there was about sixteen of us out of a whole uh, battalion. And uh, all of us took the four months recruit, uh, recruit training, and uh, at the same time, in, no 
no details. We didn't pull any details for that four months, so that was all we did was train. And uh, out on the in the training area, I, the first thing was vehicle training mostly. Of course, you got all your marching and so forth before that, but uh, did your vehicle training and. Another young fellow and myself were sitting behind a half track. And, oh yeah. They also had motorcycles. I said, well, this is one thing that they'll never get me on is those things. Well, I was set it at the wrong time because the sergeant was standing around behind us and he heard us. <laughs> so that was the next thing I was on and I became a motorcycle rider. And then uh, shortly after that, then, uh, they opened up the Armored Force School at Fort Knox, and I went to one of the, uh, to, well, in fact, I went to the first radio operator course that they had, and I finished it three months, and went out and did a little radio operating, and wasn't long after that that I went out on, I went on a, uh, with a bunch on another, to another unit, and went to a, the fourth, uh, what they call the fourth armored division in uh, New York then. And I stayed up there about six months and came back uh, to Fort Knox again. What did the, you do the six months up there? Uh, train, tra train recruits. Oh, okay. We had a brand new division up there too. <coughs> so, excuse me. And uh, of course I started making my rank there. I was a PFC when I went up there. And I finally got to be a platoon sergeant. And then they sent a bunch back to Fort Knox to form another division. So I went back as a uh, radio sergeant there at the time. And a communications sergeant. Could you and explain to us, um, we don't have much on training and radios and radio systems at that time. Can you mm -hmm. give me a little short course on that? Well, when I went to school, the first thing you learned was the Morse code. And you were supposed to be able to take about 25 words a minute with a pencil. And that's going pretty fast. And But there were five, five letter groups. So it wasn't too bad. And uh, of course, I didn't learn too well at the beginning of the thing, because my mind wouldn't take it. <laughs> and uh, one day the colonel that was in charge of the school came in. And instead of taking code, I was sitting there writing my future wife a little love letter. So, and he caught me doing that when I was supposed to be taking code, and told me he says, "You got another month and a half." to finish this class with 25 words a minute or I'll have you back here for another three months. And oh, oh no, thank you. <laughs> and he, mean, he went in and told me and showed me where it was costing the military $3,000, $1,000 a month to send me to that course. And he said, you're going to learn. Well, I did. I came out second highest finally. So anyway, that was... Uh, the end of that. Of course, they wanted to promote the two of us to master sergeants to come back and teach in the school, and I couldn't take that. So I passed up the master sergeant's rating, and the other fellow, the number one, he did, though, he took it. And uh, so that when I went back to the unit, and then they sent us all that cadre to New York then. Well, after finishing that one, and coming back to Fort Knox with the 5th Armored Division, helped form the 6th Armored, the 7th Armored, the 8th Armored, and there we had about, uh, I think I had, by this time I made 1st Sergeant, and I had uh, about 8 men in, the, in my orderly room. Some of them were already 1st Sergeants, but the others were going to make 1st Sergeants, and. Uh, go to units corresponding to the one I was in, which was a reconnaissance. And uh, so we didn't know which one was going where, so they decided, well, just put a 
the division numbers in a hat and draw them. And that's what we did. So I wound up with the 12th Armored. And uh, of course we moved to, well, then Camp Campbell, which is now Fort Campbell. And of course we got all of our recruits and started training there then. And, uh, besides, besides the Morse code, what other aspects of, of that did you do? Oh, you, you learned a little of the uh, electrical part of it, uh, repair. And uh, some of the men were lucky enough, they went to, I think the name of the place was at Valparaiso, Indiana, to go to um, repair school, radio repair school. But I didn't get to make that, but uh, I learned a little from what they, the others that came back could teach us. So. And of course the communications sergeant, he taught us a lot too. So. That gave us a head start on it, you might as well say, I guess. And But I didn't do too much of it. I made first heard it before I used it too much. So. <laughs> and I think I made first heard it in 41, 42, I guess. I was only in about a year or two that I made first heard it. And then, of course, we moved to Cap Campbell then. And I did... At, at the beginning in Camp Campbell, I did help train and uh, well set up uh, training schedules, et cetera, to help train the recruits and did some of the classes and so forth. And later on, I got reduced. I was going to get married, and uh, the general put out a little note that all NCOs and officers would stay there for an open house one weekend, the weekend I was going to get married. And I didn't appreciate that too much. <laughs> and uh, so I handed my commanding officer my stripes and I'm going home anyway. So I'm not an NCO anymore, I can go. And which I did, and I overstayed that <laughs> for a couple of days. And uh, of course when I came back I got reduced, and uh, or which I was reduced anyway. And then he reduced me further down. Well, he's going to give me a sergeant's stripes. And well, it wound up that uh, the motorcycle sergeant took first sergeant, and I took a motorcycle sergeant. He made me back to a sergeant anyway. So later on, way I was picked one of the uh, of one of the men from the battalion to go to uh, umpire maneuvers in Tennessee for other outfits were get ready to go overseas. So you, you judged them. You were one of the umpires. Um, umpire. Okay, tell me about that. I've never met an umpire. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well you stayed, uh, you were assigned certain units and uh, of course comparable to the unit type of work that you did. And um, I, I was with one of the reconnaissance troops and stayed with them, which uh, you follow them and just watch them, and then you rate them, and, uh, whether they were good or bad or indifferent or whatever. But uh, most of them were really good, and I never turned one down, I, as far as flunking one, you might say. But uh, I stayed there for three months, and then we went back. Uh, when I got back, well, I'd been promoted to a staff sergeant, and then I was put in another troop. I had a headquarters troop when I was the first sergeant, and then I went to A Troop. And so then, of course, we went on the three-month maneuvers ourselves then, and from there on to Camp Barkley, Texas. What so, was your impression of Camp Barkley, Texas, when you first came in on that train? It wasn't much, I'll tell you. <laughs> I kind of let down a little bit because we were ex really expecting uh, some barracks, I guess, and there was no barracks. It was, we may well say tent city, and it was tents with built up boards around it, so walls, board walls, and uh, plywood floorboards, so, and pot bellied stoves, and it was a little cooler in the winter time, and et cetera. <laughs> so, but 
did, I did really do some good training there and had got some good training with the whole division then. Were you, um, did you come in before the troops, okay, were you part of the cadre or, or not? You were just part of the... What, for coming to Camp Barkley? Uh -huh. No, I, I was, uh, I came with my unit. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, I didn't come ahead of time. Okay. And uh, after I got there, I think I, I remember right, I operated the officers club for a while. <laughs> and before we got really going into training. And then I was assigned as a platoon sergeant to one of the troops, or one of the, you know, at the A troop then I was assigned as a platoon sergeant for one of the uh, platoons. And uh, we went to train. Tell me what your, what your role with your platoon was. I was a platoon sergeant. Okay, and what, what were your duties? What oh, did to help train and, uh, oh, I don't know, <laughs> I can't hardly explain it, but then you really uh, were in charge of them and you saw that they got to do where they were supposed to go at certain times and did all the training and helped do the training. So, and then I got reduced again at Camp Barkley, our loving general, reduced me to a private. Can you tell us why or would you rather not talk about that? Well, I, I'd rather not okay. talk about that. But okay. uh, anyway, it didn't take me long to make back my platoon sergeant. And then, uh, of course, we had to get our vehicles and all the stuff ready for overseas. And when we went overseas, then why? My first sergeant, our first sergeant, got reduced, so <laughs> which was kind of bad. I kind of liked the guy myself a little bit, but a lot of people didn't like him. But anyway, uh, as being a first sergeant before, well, my troop commander decided he'd promote me back to first sergeant, in which I stayed the rest of the time in Europe, and, compl and after that too. So, and I decided. I would stay in the Army after I came back. And uh, I had a wife and a child and no job to go to, so I decided I'd try it for another three years, and I was a first sergeant well, at that time, which was pretty good money. And so then after that, things kept getting better and better, so the type of units that I went to. So I decided to stay in. And I did for 30 years. So. Did you stay in reconnaissance? Pardon? Did you stay in reconnaissance? Or? No, no. Uh, after I came back, I, I didn't do any reconnaissance. I went to uh, back to Fort Knox, where I originally enlisted, and went into a, a cal well, I did go into a cavalry outfit there, but then they changed it over to artillery training outfit. So I asked and I hadn't been in the ar artillery, so, but we did a little and that didn't last long. And then we got sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. They reopened Fort Jackson. They had closed it down, but they reopened it. And I had a uh, casual outfit there, which took care of all the post dirty details. <laughs> <laughs> I call them dirty details. We had to go take care of rifle ranges and set up barracks and things for other troops coming in and uh, any AWOLs and things like that. I had to send NCOs and privates what are you, out to pick them up and bring them back. So, that was about all I did there. And then for the time being, then after a while, then they started up a... Uh, Infantry training regiment there, and I took over as sergeant major of that. So that didn't last very long for me. I think that 13 weeks training was, oh, I don't know, it was monotonous in a way. And I had a chance, there was a captain that came from um, New Mexico, and from Sandia Base, New Mexico 
which was a special weapons training outfit, atomic weapons. And so he said I had the qualifications to go there. And one other master sergeant on the post, the two of us were qualified to go. So my colonel said, they told me I, that I could go if I wanted to. So we did. And I wound up, stayed with the, that type of units the rest of my career. And till I guess when, about the last four years, Of course, during that time, they changed uh, ranks, added two ranks to the service, which was uh, up until that time was E7 was a rank had been, so they added E8 to D9. And then I went to those outfits and went back overseas with one, back to Germany with one, and stayed another three years with it. And came back to the States, <laughs> activated another one and went back to Germany with it for another three years. So then I came back to White Sands Proving Ground in, uh, I believe it was in 57. And uh, got tangled up with the White Sands Signal Agency as the operations sergeant for them. And uh, supposed to have had a colonel but he got sick, went to the hospital, so it left me with no officers. And I wound up as a, actually the training officer, which though I didn't get the rank to go with it. But, and uh, stayed with them for a while until the, and these two new ranks came out. And uh, I didn't get one, and I was the rank and master sergeant out of about 150 of them on the post. Uh, I can't stand this, so I asked for a transfer and went back to um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And there I thought I would make it, but I didn't. And I wound up as a operations NCO for another outfit like that, going back to Europe again. So, But while I was over there, then I made E8 and E9 both. And I came back and retired as a E9. Um, but when I came back, then I, I went to uh, the National Guard as an um, instructor and stayed with them for almost four years until I did retire. <coughs> Not an instructor, but an advisor to the National Guard. And that was quite an experience. And, well, they do have some people, I'll tell you, they are good. Of course, I mean, the guard where I was now, others may have not been so good, but I went to South Carolina to the National Guard and as an advisor for about four years when I retired. You've had a lot of military experiences. Quite a bit. <laughs> do you remember, uh, do you remember the first time you ever Face the battle. Do you remember that day? Not really. I mean, you were just led into it. Mm -hmm. uh, when we first went to Germany, uh, I'm sorry, to overseas uh, in '44, they kind of gave uh, they worked you into it. When we wound up guarding the coastline for a, a few weeks, was our first duty. And uh, after that, then we went to garden the uh, Red Ball Supply uh, vehicles. And the two roads that they used, the highways they used for transporting um, supplies to the front line, and they came back on another road. And it was called the Red Ball? Red Ball. And uh, so then. After that, we just started moving into the front lines on our, with our division. And when you, when you think about the nine, the eighth, nine second, what, what were the aspects of that weaponry? What all went with the nine second recon? Did you have? I mean, you, 
did you have pep tracks and did you have the uh, you can tell I don't I haven't interviewed many 97 <laughs> so you need to tell us about the 97 okay um, the troop that I was in we had jeeps some of them had mounted uh, 30 caliber machine guns and 50 caliber machine guns mounted on them uh, and we had uh, half tracks I think it was three half tracks in a troop and one was supply one was uh, I, I believe one was uh, with the kitchen more or less for supplies too and the other one was in the motor pool with the motor sergeant had one and they were 50 caliber machine guns on mounted on those and then we had the armored cars with 37 millimeter guns in those with the turret in turret type and with 50 caliber machine guns and uh, that was about our type of uh, weapons and, and in addition to our rifles and submachine guns and pistols. Where would you be in relationship to the Armored Infantry Battalion? Well, we were in the front all the time looking, trying to find the enemy. Okay. So, scouts? Scouts, that's what it amounted to, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And uh, some nights we'd just drive down the highway firing weapons to try to draw their fire to find out where they were. And that was kind of tedious. And, uh, of course, that was part of what that little thing that you read a few minutes ago that it showed you. Well, tell us about that. Well, I'd like to have it on <laughs> It wasn't funny at the time, but this thing is just a little bit wrong. He, he wasn't there to see what went on, but... Uh, he wrote it up the way he wanted to write it after what happened, I more or less. But it turned out about the same. But anyway, we were in uh, scouting that night. We had the whole troop going down a street uh, road, and uh, the front of the column got stopped for some reason or other. And then the <laughs> where we wound up was in a it was in a little town, and we were right in the cross street. And the moon was shining just as bright as if you had a searchlight out there almost. And uh, we heard some singing carrying on coming down from up above. We couldn't tell who it was, but uh, of course my driver was born and raised in Germany. And uh, he said, well, these those are German soldiers singing German songs. I said, oh, oh. I said, Otto, get this vehicle out of the middle of this street so it won't be in the moonlight so he did they hadn't got that close but at that time they uh, they thought a lot of this stuff was their own vehicles because we were so far in back of their front lines all both might as well say and uh, so I told Otto I said get behind this half track and wait till they get out in the moonlight and then we'll tell them to put up their hands well Otto he <laughs> didn't quite wait long enough and he got out and told them to put up their hands and one of them fired and of course that was what you read was I thought it had killed him because it knocked him down and it knocked him out his head uh, his helmet came off and his head hit the uh, stones and knocked him out and I had two hand grenades one in each hand and I just lobbed them over into the dark there where they were well that was the last of the firing we didn't go in to see if we'd killed any or anything like that we didn't hear any more noise so anyway we started moving out and I went over to Otto and he did get up. I called the medics and they came back. We looked him over good. We couldn't find anything where he'd been shot, really. No blood, no nothing. <laughs> so finally he came to, and that's when he got up and found out his wallet. And his wallet had been cut right into it. That's what knocked him down. And uh, 
So there we went on, <laughs> but it was quite a experience. But did you receive orders from? Um, who did you receive orders from? Did they kind of have a uh, plan that each night you got new orders? Oh yeah, them? and most of the time uh, the troop commander would go to battalion or squadron headquarters and get the. Uh, mission for the following day or that night or whatever and most of the time it was night and day it seemed like and uh, how far ahead did y'all average were you out two or four ten miles or oh and maybe three or four miles or something like that but you and there was tanks and infantry behind us we knew where they were most of the time and uh, and usually like you say, our uh, main uh, objective to us to find the enemy and then inform the, our commanding officer. And he informed the squadron and went on up the line. And then the infantry and uh, tanks moved through us then and did the, er, most of the fighting then because we weren't uh, equipped enough to do a lot of fighting. I only had 129 men total and uh, lost a few of those along the way too till one time I think I was down to about 75 out of the 129. So. But uh, they sent us replacements as fast as they could but most of the time they weren't the type of replacements that we really needed. To talk. <laughs> and uh, a lot of these boys had been back to the hospitals when they just send them back to a unit. They didn't care what unit it was that they went to. A man might be a, well, in fact, I got mess sergeant. I got, in fact, I got an Air, Air Force man one time as a replacement. I said, oh, you people, I don't know. <laughs> so we had to train them as we went along most of the time. But it turned out good. Radio communication. Were y'all having to uh, lay wires or? At, oh yeah. Uh, well, what's the wire? Now we go out on uh, patrols at night or something like that. Then we have to lay telephone communication wires and uh, use ra uh, telephones mostly. Did we did have some uh, backpacks, radios? So we could use those and. Uh, we stayed in communication pretty well with the higher headquarters. So, and in our vehicles, of course, we had the big radios. So, and we had, I guess we had one in communication with division. We had one in with our uh, squadron headquarters and then the others within the platoon. Well, we, was all, we could all hear each other as far as that went. So, was it before you, were you in in battle before you got your club, got, was it a real, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> um, got in a real tight situation? Or was that every day of your life? Well, almost, yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, we had, so most of the time we had to take little small towns and we ran into places where they were set up waiting for us and along the railroad tracks or something like that and then uh, we'd lose a part of our outfit because they had tanks that had rocket launchers on them and they couldn't get under some of these railroad bridges so they had to go somewhere we'd lose them for half a day maybe and they had to go around and, c and catch back up with us and things like that but uh, and then one time we ran into a bunch of children that they had put out in foxholes to uh, hold us up so that the German soldiers could get away and I heard some sobbing and where in the world does that sobbing come from because we were out in the field and uh, I kept hearing it, and I kept crawling, trying to find where it was. 
and come to find out that they had several young boys that they had put out there with rifles to hold us up so they could get away, really, is what it amounted to. But they were scared to death and reached down in the foxhole, pulled one up. We got them all, took them back to their families back in the little old town where they had come from. And, of course, the German parents were really proud to see us bringing them back and not shooting them and things like that, so, which we weren't real cruel people. So, but, uh, yeah, you ran up across against some pretty heavily armed forces down then. But then, uh, what was it, uh, winter of 44, 45, Christmas time came, and we went into Germans' houses, and they invited us in to have a Christmas supper with them, and just about everybody quit firing at that time. So we had a real nice supper with the German couple. And of course, we took off the next morning as though nothing had happened. So, but. Tell me about the days leading up to Hurlstein. What, where you were, what your role, what, where you were when all that happened? Well, we were in a town just back from Hurlstein a little ways. And we had wound up that night or evening, afternoon, whatever. Uh, being fired on, and the firing was coming from a church steeple. Of course, we didn't get into Hurlishheim battle as such ourselves. The infantry and the tanks, they wound up getting hurt pretty bad there. But uh, anyway, we spent the night back uh, trying to, oh, what happened was that one of, the, one of our boys uh, that had been firing at the church steeple tried to kill the German a tracer bullet and caught, uh, caught the steeple on fire. So we spent most of the night trying to put the fire out for the church. <laughs> and we were wet and it was cold. And the monks in their place of business, they built up a big fire. I, I don't think I ever saw a fireplace as large as the one that they had. And they built up a fire and we went in took her clothes off and dried them out. And of course, they wanted to bring us in a little wine, which they did, and it was a wine country too. And we wound up having a few drinks, but we also got dried off. And then the next day, uh, we did some scouting around between us and Hurlishine. And that was about all we did. We didn't lose in our outfit I don't think we lost a man as far as Hurley Shyam went. So But it was rough. Especially for the infantry, the tanks. What is what is it like for a division to experience like that? What does it do to morale? Oh, I don't I don't know if it affected the morale as so much. Yeah. You 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 were kind of angry and you wanted to go on and finish it up, get them. And uh, I think, when, oh, and uh, of course at the time we were um, our outfit, our division was with the Seventh Army over there. That's where we went to to begin with. And then uh, General Patton decided he needed another division, armored division, to make his drive to the Rhine River. So we were selected to leave the Seventh Army and go to the Third Army, which we did. And then, while we was making our drive to the Ryan River, I ran into a uh, little old town. We was going through, and I kept hearing quite a bit of noise, racket, hollering, and et cetera, back up on one of the little hills there. And I told my driver, "I think we better see what's up there." And so we drove up there, and it was a little uh, prison camp where some of our boys that had been taken in Hurlishheim were there. 
so we relieved them. But the funny part was, they weren't really locked in. <laughs> the, their uh, corp, the German corporal that was supposed to be taking care of it, had uh, he lived about two little towns back. His family was about two two little towns back from there. So he used to leave the gates open and go, <laughs> go home at nights. And these boys, well, most of them were working on the farms. And uh, they got fed real good. And they weren't trying to get away anyway, I don't think. <laughs> so anyway, they didn't have much of a chance anyway, really, at that time. And uh, so I asked them if, uh, if they needed some cigarettes or some food or something like that. And they said, oh, man, no. <laughs> so we got all the cigarettes we can handle and all the food we can handle. And the corporal would got uh, Red Cross supplies and things for them and kept them going good. So we left them as they were and went on about our business. Of course, they got picked up later on. But there wasn't a lot we could do with them anyway because we didn't have the room to take them with us. We didn't have the weapons for them either. So we knew they'd be picked up later on. So, Of course, if it had been uh, uh, a case of having to pull them out, then we would have done that, sure. But, you know, they weren't bothered, so. And they was enjoying themselves, I think, a little bit, much more so than we were. <laughs> But did your, um, did y'all's orders, what you did change as y'all were pushing across in front of Patton? No, not too much, because when we met Patton, he told us that he wanted us to reach the Rhine River within about five days, I think that's what he gave us, five days and nights. And midnight one night, he wanted somebody to be there at the Rhine River. And we beat his time by about 30 minutes, I think. So, and I think we were five days and nights. We went without sleep. We did everything on the road and just kept pushing. And I think it was a good idea that we did. And... Uh, do you remember, do you remember reaching the line, what it was like for y'all? Oh yeah, very much so. Uh, we went into a little town that uh, right over the Ryan River, I think. Worms, I believe, was the name of it. And, uh, well, of course, we got kicked back out just as soon as we hit it. And I lost one man there and got his head blown off. And, and uh, we got kicked back out of the little old town. But we had reached it, so that was the main objective. And, of course, we didn't get to go across it right then. And... Uh, General Patton gave us three days and nights back off and sent up a infantry company to guard us so we could get sleep and rest for three days and nights and get a shower and all that stuff, so a little uh, cleaning up and get our vehicles and everything kind of looked after. And after five days and nights, you uh, get a little messed up, so you have to clean up a little. But then after the three days and nights, when back to the front we went again. <laughs> By this time, though, that they did have the, uh, uh, well, what you call it, kind of bridge across the Rhine River, uh, the floating type bridge. So we went, pontoon bridge, yeah. So we went across it. But just as soon as we reached it, of course, they brought the tanks and the infantry on in, so that gave us a chance to get a little rest. Did you ever see Patton personally? Oh, yes, two or three times. Tell me about him, your impression. <laughs> well, <laughs> he was a man. <laughs> like they said, is his blood and your guts or your guts and his blood or your blood and his guts or something. <laughs> but anyway, no, he, he was really a, a go-getter. And the first time I met him was that they had given us a coordinates where to meet him in a certain little uh, area. 
And I said, well, we hit some firing, and I said, well, no, we're hitting the German front lines here. And the coordinates they're giving us is behind that front line to meet Patton and then at those coordinates. Well, we called up Third Army Headquarters and said, well, maybe somebody made a mistake. You know, they came back and told us, no, it was not a mistake. That's where he said he'd be. And that's where you're supposed to meet him. Well, we, we made it. We got there. And it was just he and his driver in a Jeep sitting there in the woods, a little wooded area. Uh, of course, I, we had been driving for what, three or four day, days and nights to get from the Seventh Army to the Third Army. So my boys were quite beat. And I put, up, put out a uh, security on outposts and then uh, security inside of the area and then I lay down. Well I hadn't been lying there very long till somebody hollered for a sergeant. So I went over and there were General Patton and my troop commander talking and he asked me how soon I could get my men and my outfit across the, what they called the initial point which was going out of that woods. And I said, well, it'd probably take about an hour or so. He said, well, you've got 30 minutes, and I want to see the last vehicle going out of this woods. So that was our taking off to the Ryan River. And one of the little river we were supposed to be able to take, and they blew it before we got there. So we couldn't get across it well. I got to looking at the map and I found that there was a uh, railroad bridge down from that. I said, well, maybe it's still intact. And if it is, maybe we can go across it. So that's what we did. And uh, while we were getting this railroad bridge fixed up, General Patton came up then. So that was the second time I saw him, I think. And I there was another time somewhere along the line I saw him, but uh, I think it was about three or four times. But he wasn't real bad for, for us to get along with, but he, you know, he was rough. Don't think he wasn't. And I think that he was the one, I believe myself, that saved the Army. Because he got to that Ryan River and he just kept going and going. But by this time, they were getting uh, jet planes in the air and more equipment and whatever. It seemed like to me, I I could be wrong, but uh, I know there was jet planes getting in the air and we we ran overran some of their fields with those. But I like General Pat myself very much. Beg your pardon? Did you have did you have a soldier that stands out in your mind that you The first one that got killed. One of my sergeants. And I was standing pretty close to him. And he got it right through the head. But I think it was our own people that did it. That was I really think so. Uh, because he and I were standing at a little old barn just out at edge of a town <coughs> and uh, we had found the enemy and the tanks were making their attack through it. I think they saw us and thought it was the enemy or something because in those tanks you can't get a good look really uh, or I think that uh, they just saw some soldiers there and, they, and since they were going to fight them that they thought it was uh, the enemy and they got him, but then they didn't get me, thank goodness. And but that, that's the one that stands out. What was his name? Pardon? What was his name? I can't think of his name now right offhand. Yes. But I... He's a good son. Oh, I, you had so many... Well, staying in the Army so long and trying to mem remember so many oh, names, yeah. you just can't do it hardly. Yeah. And... Uh, even half of my own men during that time, I can't remember their names.
That makes sense because you've had so many. Oh, thousands and thousands. Thousands of them. Yeah. Yeah. When you, um, after y'all got past the Ryan, what was the, where did you hit, where did they hit you next? Well, really, where we had it to was uh, to Austria, and that's where we wound up in Austria. What was it like between the Ryan and Austria? Was it pretty hard going? Or? Well, in our case, I don't think it was so much uh, really hard going because we uh, just about had the whip then, and uh, a lot of them were wanting to give up, and they didn't really want to fight. and. We took a lot of them. Well, it's just like that thing that you were reading there. There was more than any 12 or 15 vehicles that came out of that woods. There was hundreds of soldiers came out. <laughs> we stood and looked and watched them go by for two and a half hours, I know. Vehicles and soldiers. And they still all had their weapons and everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, Yeah, they were they were ready to give up, or wanting to really, and uh, oh, one other instance I remember very well was driving down the highway at night time, and I we had stopped because the head of the troop had run into a little firefight, and I kept hearing a noise, sitting here waiting to move out, and I kept hearing a noise, and I. I'm, no, I told Otto, Otto, my driver, I said, Otto, I know what that noise is. But for the life of me, I can't think of it. And he kept bothering me and worrying me. So I said, let's drive down this way a little bit, see if we can see what this is. Well, it was being on the farm. It was a horse-drawn wagon outfit. More big mortar outfit, and it was trace chains that was making the noise, and I knew I knew what it was, but it could it wouldn't come to me. And there was a whole battalion of these mortars, so we talked them into giving up, which they did. So they was they was ready. But they were using horses. Oh yeah, they had a lot of stuff that was horse drawn. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Oh, one uh, one night while we were going through some little old town, um, Otto was listening to some people who were German people who were standing on the corner talking, and he said, "What they're saying is they can't understand how in the world Hitler ever expected to win something like this with all these vehicles and they got nothing but horses and wagons." Of course, I guess they had seen a lot of their big tanks and things like that, but uh, that was the um, remarks that they were making. Um, oh yeah, they had a lot of it. It was nothing to go down and find a horse and dead on the highway and have to drag him off to get by or something. <laughs> well, if you were to look since you were there and you saw and you experienced all this, the Panzers and all that, were they kind of evenly distributed through the armies or, or were they just, had they, had they, by the time we're talking about, had it just, they had lost so many vehicles that they had to go to the horses or? Oh no, they had that? the, no, they had them all along. Oh, oh yeah. No, the Panzers were, of course, they were some tanks, I'll tell you, but uh, they would mire down in uh, soft ground. They couldn't use them too well. They, they, they had to keep them on the highways or they couldn't use them hardly. That was how heavy they were. And, of course, we didn't have hardly anything that would stop them either, but unless you could hit their tracks and knock a track loose or something maybe but they were bad bad things we we came across one sitting up in a barn one time and had run out of gasoline fuel so we confiscated it 
and put a painted it that night and put the uh, American letters and things on it. <laughs> drove, drove it out the next day. <laughs> did that happen very much? Oh, we do a lot of that. Yeah, we did. We wound up with uh, German vehicles and big, oh, what you call Duesenbergers and things like that. But they get headquarters confiscated them from us, too, so <laughs> after they found out we had them. <laughs> but right at the end of the war. But it, it was quite a thing. think about World War II and all the things that you experienced. Is there one moment that always stays in your mind more than any other? No, not really. I don't think so. It was all bad. Except like that was a few humorous things that after it was over with that was kind of humorous, but at the time it wasn't really. But uh no, you're you're facing. Well, I think that three days we had off the front line was all we had the whole time from what was in October or November of '44 to May of '45. That was the only time we had off of the front line. How did y'all physically do that? Pardon? How did, how physically? Did you physically, just physically capable. Well, of we doing that? our training had made us physically able to do it. When I first went in the Army, I think I weighed about 128 pounds and about a 28-inch waistline, and I wound up 185 pounds and about a 32 waistline. So, but physically, they trained you good. That was one of the first things I got into when I went in the Army was physical training. And so your those, stamina was just able to carry oh, yeah. through and not sleep and not eat right mm. and just do. Yeah. Carry on and wash your clothes and your helmet and things like that. So. And try to keep some dry socks along. Of course, they, we kept three pair of socks all the time. One on our helmet, one around our stomach, and the other pair on. Try to keep, rotate them and keep from getting uh, our feet frozen. Things like with wet socks or something. But uh, physically, I think just about everybody was in real good shape. Was the war any, was it different than what you expected? No, not really, I don't think so. We, we've been taught I, uh, what to expect. And I had a troop commander that was he was gung-ho, <laughs> but thank goodness he was when it wound up. And uh, we started out, um, yeah, even at our own barracks and things like that, that uh, where they told us the hedge, li hedge lines would be uh, trip-wired and things like that. Uh, so you'd set off uh, all different types of fireworks to kill you going through it. And uh, they were. Uh, they had told us they would be, and he taught us. Uh, he went and got uh, different types of things that, wanted, that we could use on each other in our own barracks and all. And if you set one off, you didn't get a pass for the weekend, things like that. And if you didn't set any off, then you'd get a three-day pass. So he worked towards that. And... Of course, he had 128 men looking, trying to get a hold of him, where maybe only five or six was after one of us. But man, and he like never got to go home. <laughs> and his family was—I think his family was there in, uh, in here in Abilene at the time. But he couldn't leave the post. But, but it taught us, it really did. Well, the same thing in, in, in houses. Now, we got into Germany, of course, 
we could go in and use a house to sleep in, things like that. And Otto and I ran into one one time that was empty. The little town was almost empty. And we went into the house. We was going to spend the night there. And it, the only thing left in the house was bed springs. And it was kind of odd that that was the only thing left in the house. And, <coughs> excuse me, and we was both back about ready to throw our bedrolls up on the springs. I said, uh-uh, wait a minute, Otto, I think I saw something. And there was a wire running up from the bed springs to the attic. And if we'd have thrown it over there, it would, the whole building would have gone up. So it's just things that, I don't know, you just look for them. And you weren't really looking, but you, you did see it anyway. Alarm. Yeah. Just educate uh, yourself. Right. That's the way I felt about it. So. But I, like I say, he taught us real good. And he was the first one, I think. No, he wasn't either. Yeah, I guess the first night in combat he got hit. My, that troop commander did. And he got an elbow shattered. No, I don't. It, well, it, we weren't in a town, really. We was out in the boondocks, you might as well say. And we had been sent out on a patrol. And we ran into a, a bunker. And, of course, it was about six foot thick, I think, with reinforced with steel. You could, with what little we had, and on foot, we couldn't take it. So, anyway, that's where he got hit. And couple of other people. But it was bad. And uh, we had to send him on back home. And he shouldn't have been out in front to begin with. Kept trying to tell him that, but he wouldn't listen. He said, well, if I expect the men to do it, I got to do it to show them that I can take it too. And I said, but you know, you're supposed to be leading this. But he got hit, and we went around the bunker then, and on the way back, I had a, another lieutenant, or exec officer took over, commanding officer, and ran us right back into the same bunker. And the ground was real hard. It was in the winter time and it was frozen over. He said, Well, we're going to take this bunker. I said, Lieutenant, whatever, you're going to take six inches of concrete, whatever, six feet, rather, just about, with a 30 caliber machine gun. I said, You couldn't knock it out with a tank. So, anyway, we were. They opened up fire on us and all, too, and then they shot up some flares asking for artillery concentration. I said, well, now, if they get that artillery, we are gone. And uh, that flare came down and hit me right on the helmet and fell over in front of me. I couldn't move, but I made a truck rut look like a manhole. I flattened out like a snake in it. And I had to lay there, I couldn't move, because if I moved, I was dead. And looked through that flare, and I almost went blind. And come, well, by the time I came back home, my eyes had gone bad. And I've been wearing glasses ever since. So it was the flare? It did, yeah. It, it hurt my eyes real bad, because when it went out, I couldn't see anything. But anyway, we got back to our vehicles, and my sight started coming back. You know, those were the things you got into. When you, when you had situations like that where you really knew that probably the decision made is not the best, were you able to verbalize that or most of the time you just went into it and just did it? Well, most of the time you just went in and did it. 
uh, you'd try to talk to an officer, and most of the time there was reasonable things that, or they were reasonable, and if your way of, uh, he thought your way was better than his, we tried. So, but, <clears throat> but that lieutenant, his, his way was always the only way. But the rest of them worked that way. But I didn't. Well, we, uh, I can't talk about him too much because he was an officer, and you had to kind of respect him in a way. But you had to cross hairs with him once in a while. At what point did you realize that the war would probably be ending? Would be what? Ending. What, 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 was there a time that you really realized, hey, this is about to be over? Yeah, because <laughs> uh, things slacked up, and you'd only run into an outfit now and then, a little battle. And uh, I think a few days before it was over, really, that they had called us up on the radio and told us that the war was over. Well, I happened to have two fifths of whiskey at the time. And I wound up drinking one of them and chasing it with the other. And about that time, we got an air burst from artillery on us. And we had to carry on for another three or four days before we really got out of it. So. You talked about uh, at the end it was uh, things were getting easier. When y'all first landed and when you, and let's talk up to the point, uh, into the maybe a month before the war was over. Was there a battle every day or? Oh, no, no, battle? no, not every day. Okay. Uh, you might go for a day or two and not hit a thing. Mm -hmm. But you didn't travel too fast. You had to take things day at a time, really. And no, and you might run, only run into one or two soldiers sometimes. They were trying to delay action, things like that, and that could delay, could delay it for several hours, maybe with only two or three snipers. So, but uh, like I say, that well, some uh, the units were shot up, and there was no uh, getting them back together. You might as well say because uh, they just scattered. Some of them took off a wall, everything else, I guess, because they knew it was over more or less. But I think the, well, I know what the outstanding thing was, was Buchenwald Prison Camp. That was a, when we went into it, and the people were, well, they were mummies, might as well say, because they had been starved to the point where they didn't know what was going on. They didn't have a good mind left, really. And bodies being burned, in the incinerators, and gas chambers, and all that stuff. And how come us to find it was that uh, we was going down, well, we was trying to beat a German tank outfit to a bridgehead. And they was on one road going to it, and we was on another one trying to go to it, and then we came through this forest. And on the, on the map, well, there were, we came across a crossroad, and on the map there was no crossroad on it. So uh, now how come there's a crossroad and it's not on the map? And everything else had been on the map. Well, we sent a jeep down each way and found out we were sitting in the middle of a concentration camp which was Buchenwald. And so naturally we had a little fight there and we did we lost our uh, run to the bridgehead. We didn't beat the Germans to it because of the concentration camp. Were, you, were the Germans already out of the concentration camp? Oh, no, 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 so no. So y'all, they got surprised them? Oh, yeah. That's the reason they called us the Mystery Division. Uh, we were every place they didn't know where we were. And we'd be in back of their front lines and things like that. that 
I kind of wore them down, and it really hurt their morale, I think. Because <coughs> I had one uh, German soldier on a motorbike one night, and he was going to take a message to his front lines, and we was already behind him. We captured him, and he says, my goodness. He says, I don't know how many times I've run into you people. So, yeah. First of all, was it a Jew? It was a prisoner of war camp, or was it a concentration? Concentration camp. Concentration camp. Yeah. Mostly Jewish people, yes. And uh, even at that, I think one of them beat us into Austria <laughs> from that concentration camp because we had to fight to get through. And he and he had on his uh, black and white striped suit and. We ran into him going into Austria, or in Austria, really. So there were some that were able to walk away. Oh yeah, well after we got a, uh, got the uh, German uh, soldiers, there was nothing to stop them from leaving. Yet. They were relieved. When, when y'all, when things were happening like that, did did y'all were American soldiers stationed there or? Mm. Just keep on going. Oh, we just we had to keep going. We we couldn't stop. We I mean we couldn't leave soldiers, some of our troops behind, yeah. or men from our troops behind, to take care of that. You know we were expecting the others to come up behind us, so which was, was the infantry and tanks and well mainly the ones that would take care of things like that was the military police. So they would come in and take over. I think that was about the worst I saw. Because we kept smelling something at the time we was going through this forest. And I'd never smelled burned flesh. And that was what it was, turned out to be. And it was terrible. That was all, will always stick to my mind, I think. So. But y'all didn't really know. Did y'all know what it was? I mean, did you realize it was a concentration camp or what, I mean? No, we didn't know it until we got uh, to the gate and found out what it was. And we blasted in the gate and they didn't have too many soldiers there as uh, really they didn't need too many. And of course we took it over and these people were just their minds, a lot of them, their minds were gone. They just milled everywhere. Were there thousands or hundreds of thousands? Oh, there was, no, I, don't, I guess there was, I really don't know how many because we didn't stay there very long. We had to get out to try to head this, uh, to to yeah, to get the bridge head. And uh, infantry and tanks was coming up behind us, so we let them take over. And, and I think one of the, another division really got credit for it, I don't remember, I think, for taking it, really. Uh, seems like it was a, a division from one of the uh, National Guard divisions that had been called on active duty, and I think they were the ones that, from, I can't remember which one it was, but it seems like they got credit for it, really. No matter who got credit, as long as it was done. When you look back at, um, you went in at, you were 18. Me? Eight, no. How old were you when you entered mm, I was the 20, Army? You were? 21, I think. 21. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you compare the person you were before World War II and the person you were after World War II, um, how did the war change you as a person? I guess it made a man out of me. <laughs> I was a boy when I went in. I was a man when I came out. That's what it amounted to. Do you think you would have been different if you hadn't gone through World War II? Oh, I'd, I think I'd have been a lot different if I hadn't gone through it. Yes. But I, I was ready to get out of the Army right after I went in. 
because I didn't like it when I first went in. And at that time, you could buy yourself out. But you could never save enough money to do it. Not, a, not on $21 a month. <laughs> and it, I guess it cost you $300 to get out. So <laughs> How much it was to that, I don't know, really. But that's what I heard, anyhow. If you were to uh, think about what you would want to leave, you have grandchildren, right? Great-grandchildren. You have great-grandchildren, great okay. Well, <laughs> Okay, if you were to think of something, and, and your great your grandchildren, great grandchildren, or children would were to listen to this tape, and you would want to leave them one message, one one something to remember, uh, either about yourself or about the war. What what would that be? If you ha if you had something you wanted them to remember. Oh. Just never get in the army. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that, really. I don't know. It's uh, to give the people that did all that credit for what they did do. There's a lot of people that doesn't believe that that this happened, like Buchenwald and all these prison camps or concentration camps and burning bodies by the train loads things like that. So we thought we had stopped all, this was all the last war, but it hasn't been, as you know. So, no, the people who went through them have a lot of, should get a lot of respect for it. And even the ones who went to Korea, the ones in Vietnam, Thank goodness I miss those, but uh, due to my type of work that I did, couldn't go. Um, Is there anything that I've, I've missed in our time together that oh, I've I, missed out, forgotten to think about? Or, I mean, you were there. You, you know the things that I, that I haven't covered. No, it was a day-to-day -day thing, and uh, you just took it as a regular duty you just fighting that was it <laughs> so you look forward to it night and day but there might be a couple of things that uh my driver and i wound up one night in a after we got into germany and wound up in a hayloft to sleep and of course we pulled in at night time next morning we, he and i woke up and it was about six or eight Germans sleeping in the same hayloft with us. Well, we both all got guns. Who's going to be the first to shoot? So we just departed. Of course, about six or eight of them and only two of us, I wasn't about to start. <laughs> and then I think, what was it, in Colbar, France. We slept in the same, uh, well, they call it a, what a, uh, Free city, no, and nobody fought in it. And we wound up sleeping in a schoolhouse with German soldiers. So, but after you got out of town, it started all over again. You're kidding. Well, and that was down down close to Hurlesheim too. Colmar was. No, I'm not kidding. So they, y'all just basically cheered, spent the night in the same building. Oh, in the, yeah. same, in the same classroom. And then the next morning, y'all got, got outside and started fighting again. No, not outside. Outside of town. Outside of town. Yeah. They, call, and, or they said it was open, open town. Mm -hmm. And both sides declared it an open city. So there was no fighting within the city. Oh. And there was, uh, I understand, several places like that. So... Oh. And then we had, one time, uh, we were fighting some Germans, and so many of them got shot up, and uh, we called a little truce there to 
get the wounded off of the battlefield, you might as well say. And uh, no fighting until we did, and we helped them get there. Now, this captain didn't ha uh, German captain didn't have any uh, medics with him, and our medics helped them bind a bunch of them up and so forth and let them take them on back. And like they said, that uh, you didn't really want to kill anybody, you wanted to wound them. It took three people away from, other, from fighting to take care of the one that's wounded. They might, at least I think that's the way they figured it. It took three people to take care of one wounded. So you never wanted to kill, you wanted to wound. And that's what we try to do. But they didn't leave you much choice a lot of times. About what? The, the medics. medics? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, we were fortunate that we had really, in my troop, we really had two good ones. And one, I think, if I remember correct, uh, had been a doctor in civilian life. And they wanted him to take a commission and in the medics. And he wouldn't do it. He wanted to stay with the troops. And I've seen him patch up and cut and dig bullets out of people that, well, we couldn't get them back to the people that should have been doing it. And he was good enough that he could do it, so he took care of a lot of them, and he saved a lot. So. <coughs> but then, now there's the boys that, uh, to me, that were the fighters, really, because they didn't carry weapons. And they weren't allowed to carry weapons. And that was a part of the code that uh, no medics would carry weapons, and they'd carry. And he believed in that cross that they wore. And he, <coughs> and we believed in it as far as the other uh, Germans were, too. They wore the same thing to denote that they were medics. But now if one had ever got caught with a pistol on him or something like that, I don't think he would have lived very long because he would have been violating that code. Then. And I've seen that boy, well, both of them get up and walk out to get somebody, knowing that those people weren't going to shoot him. I mean, he just had that feeling. that They, they knew they weren't supposed to. They wasn't going to. And they didn't. So, yeah, I think they had a real rough life. Well, had to give them a credit. But I think it carries it on pretty well through. Well, I sure do appreciate your time and your willingness to come. Well, I enjoyed it. You did a good job. Thank you. So have you. <laughs>